responsibility to make the choices but i've said before you what is good and you also have Thank you, Jesus. You can't come here and live the same. It can be. Amen. We are talking today about a topic that I've titled, Let Go of Prejudice and Lay Hold of the Promise. Let go of prejudice and lay hold of the promise. Can you, I think something changed with the sound just now. I'm not sure why. But guys, just, yeah, just fix it. Let go of prejudice and lay hold of the promise. Say, I have the promise. Don't walk around like somebody who has not been promised anything. If you walk in the flesh, you'll always see what is not available for you in the flesh you'll always see what has is being denied you you'll always see where you don't have access you'll always see where you have limitations you will always see where you don't qualify you will always see where you don't fit in you will always see the negative side of life. Amen. But when you know that you have a promise from the promise keeper who never lies. Who never lies. The Bible says the word of God is pure. The purest thing that you can find is the word of God. It says like silver refined in a furnace purified seven times over also says the word of god is proven science has been trying to prove what the word of god has established can you think about that for a moment because the bible says in hebrews 11 for the worlds that we see were framed by the things that were not seen. Amen. So the word of God has framed what we now see. But what framed what we see was invisible. But what was spoken then by God is now proven is in existence and science work is just to try and prove and find out and discover you can imagine if you go into the oceans there are species of little things and fishes and things that they have not yet named and discovered over all this six thousand years of human existence we are still trying to understand God's creation. Amen. That is powerful. We see stars in heaven. We see, moon, we see the moon. We are still trying to understand the planets that we see. Because of what God spoke. The word. So there is a promise. Every day you wake up. You are waking up to a promise. Because the sun has never been on a go slow. There's never gone on retirement. The sun always comes up. Because the sun is a reminder that you have a promise. Amen. The moon always comes up because it is a promise. The seasons always change. When we entered into August, it looked like we are just getting into winter. How many of you saw that? It was getting even colder. We had another cold front. 
But no matter how cold it could be, springtime would always come. Amen. Because it's a promise. So, we have a God who is a promise keeper. And the Bible also tells us, we like Isaac are children of promise. We are born for promise. Isaac was a son of promise. Therefore, he was born into an inheritance which was promised his father. And now we, like Isaac, we are born into that promise that was given to Abraham. Hey, come on, somebody. Say, I am born into the promise. Into an inheritance. Let me tell you something. If you don't believe that with all of your heart, you're missing something really big. We need to start there. You are born into a promise. Forget about your biological mother and father. Focus on him who never changes. Amen. He's a promise keeper. And you are born into that promise. And all of us equally have access into that inheritance. Don't be like the elder brother of the prodigal son. Who was just working and working and working. Only when the father threw a party for the younger brother, he starts complaining. But I've always been in the house. I've always stayed here. I've never left you. I've always stuck on you and I've always done the work. But why is it that you throw a party for my brother when he was lost? He has finished everything. And the father says, come on. Everything that I have. It's yours. You only ask. Amen. It's yours. And sometimes the devil will make you feel like you have been left out. You're not getting what you deserve. But let me remind you, everything he has belongs to you. Amen. So let's go to prejudice. I've quoted from uh, Wikipedia. Wikipedia is not the Bible. It just helps us with the language and knowledge of things. Amen. So it says in Wikipedia, prejudice can be effective, sorry, an affective feeling towards a person based on their perceived group membership. So it's a perception towards somebody based on where they come from, where they belong. And I'm dedicating this message specifically also for women today. And you will understand why. And one of the reasons is, I've, as much as I've seen great women who are leaders, some that are here, successful, but I've also equally seen women that have failed in leadership because of prejudice. Because they had preconceived ideas about men. And they tended to overreact or to be afraid and to be intimidated. Prejudice can be an affective feeling towards a person based on their perceived group membership. The word is often used to refer to a preconceived, usually unfavorable evaluation or classification of another person based on that person's perceived personal characteristics, such as political affiliation, uh, sex, gender, gender identity, beliefs, values, social class, age, disability, religion, sexuality, race, ethnicity, language, nationality, culture, complexion. Complexion. I'm, I'm, I'm darker than your average South African. So one of the things that I've experienced and, 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 and maybe I look Nigerian or something. Um, and when I go into a shop, you know, the teller greets me in English, assuming that I'm a foreigner. I experience that all the time. That's prejudice. Amen. So that's why I sympathize with a lot of foreigners in this country. Ethnicity, language, nationality, culture, complexion, beauty, 
height, body weight, occupation, wealth, education, criminality, sports team affiliation. You know, if you say you're a Kaiser chief, there's a certain perspective. If you say you're Orlando Paris, you see? Orlando Paris people always claim uh, <laughs> Kaiser Chiefs, we are peace-loving people. That is prejudice. Occupation, wealth, uh, criminality, sport affiliation, music, taste, and um, other perceived characteristics. So, so there's a long, long, long uh, definition, but it's just more an, an, you know, a list of things that could cause prejudice because it causes perception. Amen. You've seen how somebody will look at you in a specific way. Immediately you are introduced and they, they, they realize it's not what they thought. They now look at you in a different way. How many of you have seen that? Amen. If they come here and they see me in my jeans and say, where is the pastor? And somebody says, the pastor is that one. Say, oh, so pastor, how are you? <laughs> And, and these are perceptions, amen. And it shows that it controls how we respond to others. How we treat others. How we look at them. Even how we treat them. So prejudice is a, is a kind of a double-edged sword. Because prejudice affects the one who is on the receiving end. If you have a perception towards somebody that you're meeting you're prejudicing them because of how you're talking to them of how you see them how you classify them based on your perspective but on the other side prejudice also affects you because it may rob you of certain things because of how you look at others, you're also robbing yourself as well. Children that, are to grow, that grow up and uh, taught apartheid to hate black people lend themselves in trouble because they take it to heart and they act likewise and they get out of hand and they're called racist and sometimes they're even arrested because they beat up a black person who is to blame it is the parents because they told them a perspective they poison their child when they have grown up now they look at the black person they think, think it's somebody they must just kick around and so it's a double-edged sword it can equally affect you when you suffer from prejudice because you will miss out on the good things that you can see in others. Prejudice will keep you from moving forward. Because it keeps you in the captivity of your mind. Whilst you should be moving ahead and crossing the lines. When you're supposed to cross the border... You are still looking at what is on the other side because you are prejudiced by your own perspective. So we are saying, let go of prejudice. Prejudice won't work for you. It will cause you to not see what God is leading you to. What God wants you to have because of your own corrupted perspective about what is out there what you see god had to give a vision to paul i mean to peter and he saw in a vision a whole bag of things come out a cloth with things creatures inside all kinds of creepy crawlies things that he wouldn't want to touch and as a pure Jew, he looked at that and God said, come on, kill and eat. And he said, uh -uh, I cannot eat what is unclean. God said, 
What I have cleaned, you cannot call unclean. Because he was responding according to his own prejudice. And God said, now, there's a difference. I have cleaned what you see and you're going to eat it. Because it's now cleaned. If God say, calls it clean, it is clean. Amen. So he wakes up from the dream and he realizes that now he needs to go to Cornelius, his house, who is not a Jew, and he needs to preach the gospel to him. All along he thought he was only called to the Jews. Now God is bringing him into a new season, a new perspective. And he cannot allow his prejudice to prevent him from being an apostle to the Gentiles. Are you getting me somebody? Now he's given an address. You're going to go into this address. You'll find this man. You're going to preach to him and his household. Now immediately he wakes up from the dream. People are knocking. Because God has already been speaking to Cornelius. A guy is coming. A Jew is coming to minister to you. Cornelius sends his servants to go and pick him up. And they are going. When God moves, there's no time to reason. There's no time to go back to your prejudice. As a point of reference. You need to be moving with God. So that's why we're saying, you need to let go of what is holding you. And catch up with where God is taking you. Amen. And he goes there and he preaches. When he was still preaching... The Holy Spirit shows up, comes upon all his family, Cornelius' family. And now he's got another big shock. He never thought the Holy Spirit was meant for the Gentiles. He thought it was also all, only meant for the Jews. Now they are speaking in tongues. And all the other guys that came with Peter, they're equally shocked. Wow, the Spirit of God has come upon them. Now something new that they are learning about God and what he was about to do. This is a different time. They have transitioned from the time of the Old Testament, the time of Jesus, and now they are going into the New Testament. The promise of the Holy Spirit was upon all men. Come on, somebody. And now they needed to catch up that the Holy Spirit is not for a specific group, it's for all men. So they needed to let go of that prejudice so that they can catch up with what was coming. And some of us, our prejudice will keep us from receiving what is coming. Hey, come on, somebody. Some of you have seen people falling and rolling. And now when you have to come and you're thinking, what if I fall? I come on, who cares? We must just get that devil out of you and you are fine and happy. Amen. Come on, somebody. Amen. A young preacher... I've been when the young preacher spoke to me just last week and he's a young man that I've known for some time now and 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 he helps us there and he's, uh, he's an evangelist he loves God he's born again for some time now and he's a preacher and he's you know he's he started his own ministry and so so he was asking me we were driving together and he was saying pastor tell me uh, the other time he asked, actually asked me, I didn't take it into consideration. So he told me, each time I pray for people, you know, I, I seem to have the same problems that they had. I said, no, it's not supposed to be like that. Only one man carried uh, somebody's sickness is Jesus Christ. He said, it means that uh, there's, there's access of evil somewhere. So we need to pray for it. So I forgot about that. This time he said, Pastor, you know, uh, what does it mean when I pray for people, I start shaking? And, and I've seen that happen. I immediately I told him, you need deliverance. He said, okay. And this guy is already calling himself a prophet, a pastor. <laughs> and, and, and now he's praying for people, he shakes and he doesn't understand. But what I salute him for is he was humble enough. Do not say, but I'm a preacher. What will the pastor, senior pastor think of me? You know, I'm already, I can't expose my situation. 
And there are many who are trying to pray for people, but they have evil spirits inside of them. Eh? And some of them, you allow them to pray for you. Eh? And so I said, you need deliverance. So we go into the house and, and I start praying. I you know, spoke to him a bit and, and led him into prayer. Before we finish that prayer, he starts manifesting. He was on the floor and he was saying all kinds of things and demons are speaking. Hey, you know, stop this. We've done this. Hey. I said, uh, uh, come out. I said, come out. And all these demons left him. He had, he, had, he had gone for a driver's license. I encouraged him to go for a driver's license sometimes back, and, and I helped him pay for that. And so he's been waiting for that card for some time. It was not coming. So he sent me a text and with a picture of the card. He said, after deliverance, my <laughs> huh? But what is keeping people from getting delivered? Prejudice. Prejudice. Our perceptions about things will keep us from being liberated. Our assumed statuses that we were not born with will keep us from receiving what God wants to release over our lives. We need to learn to be simple before God. And say, Lord, if you want to help me anyway, help me. Amen. Let's read from Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 to 7. But without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, say he is, and is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. By faith, Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen, moved with godly fear. He was divinely warned about something that had never happened on earth. And he did not wait for it to happen. He did not mind what people would say about what he was about to do. To build a boat, and a, not a small boat, a huge boat in the middle of nowhere. People call him crazy and all kinds of names. But the Bible says he did what? Hey, are you with me somebody? What did he do? He moved. What made him move? Godly fear. He did not wait for trouble to come. He moved with godly fear. Say, I will move with godly fear. He prepared an ark for saving of his household by which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is according to faith. Without faith, you cannot please God. Amen. Amen. So he moved with godly fear and he became heir. Unless you move with godly fear, you will not experience what it means to be an heir. You need to move because you believe God, because you fear God. You need to do things that you don't understand, things that don't make sense, because you believe the word of God is true for you, and that God will show up, that God will prove his word, no matter what happens, God is faithful. Amen. I may be wrong on other things. I may be blundering somewhere else. But if I can just hold on to the word of God, I believe the word of God will not cause me to blunder. Because it is true and I can trust God for fulfilling his word. Amen. I forget about my prejudices. I forget about what people will think of me. What I would put my entire family, my children to. What I would say to them at school. Because your father is building a boat in the middle of nowhere. And he says the end is coming. 
He's crazy. Hey, how far is the boat? Hey. Crazy. But he moved. Sometimes you've got to be crazy. Faith is crazy in nature. It does not make sense. Because you are celebrating what you don't see. You're excited about what you don't see. You are joyful about what you don't see. And nobody sees it. Only you see it. But you are happy for it because you see it coming. Amen. That is what faith is all about. The evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. You already have substance, you already have evidence of things that, is invis that are invisible. Hallelujah. Now let, let's, let's look at the story of the Samaritan woman. The Samaritan. Now, think about this woman and her own prejudices and what was keeping her to perceive a moment of history. History in the making. But her own prejudice about being a Samaritan woman was coming into the way. Her own prejudices based on her own life and her own problems were coming into the way. So I wrote there, prejudice makes you only focus on what you see on others from your own biased perspective. And when you focus on others, you're also diverting attention from what you're hiding in your own life. Everybody who is racist has got an exaggerated sense of themselves. They've got their own personal problems and they are taking it on you. They think their white skin is a license to undermine you. And you've seen how some people get so angry on the road here, those who are driving. And how sometimes they show you the middle finger. In our, in, our, in, our, in our home estate, in Pretoria East, there are two estates next to each other, and there is a traffic circle where we all meet in the morning. The other gate and the other gate, so we converge there. So people who come from there, from that other bigger estate, think they always have the right of way. Especially light-skinned people. That's the time where the missus are taking the kids to schools. And after that, they go to, to the salon or to do nails and all of that. So, now this lady, you know, I was still taking my kids to school. And this lady comes on the circle and she doesn't stop. And she, she's expecting me to just give way. So I, I kept going, you know, I sometimes forget to be a pastor on the road. <laughs> so I kept going and she got furious. I could see her, she was angry. The little kids were on the back. She's so angry and, and then she opens the window. So I opened as well. I thought she's want to say, hello brother. <laughs> and she says to me don't you see I have children here I said how oh, I also have kids in the car <laughs> that is prejudice all she sees is her own children not mine you know South Africa okay let's not go, not, let's not go deeper into that but that's what prejudice does. So there was this whole issue between the Samaritans and the Jews. 
By the way, these are the same people. During the times of the kings, when you read the book of kings, the emergence of kings in Israel, so at some point there was a division between the northern kingdoms and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was Israel. The ten tribes became the northern kingdom, and the two tribes, Benjamin and Judah, became the southern kingdom, and they, they covered the, the area of Jerusalem. So Benjamin and Judah were considered the pure Jews, because the northern kingdom were at some point in exile and 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 no no not in exile they were under a certain authority and they started to intermarry with other nationalities and therefore they lost their purity as Jews. So Jews comes from the word Judah. So the real Jews now were the people of Judah who were in Jerusalem. So basically the Samaritans and the Jews are one people. A hatred, you know, came from the Jews for the Samaritans because they saw them as people who have defiled themselves. With intermarriage comes other gods. Are you getting this, somebody? So they introduced other gods, so they were no longer, they could no longer proud to be Jews. So the people of Judah considered themselves to be pure Jews. And that's where this whole apartheid developed. So Jews undermined Samaritans. And now Jesus is meeting this Samaritan woman at the well. That's why Jesus also spoke a parable of the good Samaritan. You remember that? Because he was trying to prove a point... That everybody who is a pure Jew passes this man who has been attacked, wounded. And a Samaritan that you undermine comes and is the one that helps and attends to him. Takes him to the doctors, pays for his bills and is well. And Jesus was trying to prove it's not just about being a Jew. It's about brotherly love. It's about loving others as you love yourself. Amen. So that's the nature of the prejudice. And let's read from John chapter 4 verse 9 to 10. Then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Now there are two things here of prejudice. The first one is that She's a Samaritan of a lower class. The next thing is she's a woman. And in those days for a Jewish man to be speaking to another woman, let alone a Samaritan woman. It was like, you know, something that you should not see. And now she's putting a point back to him. How, how can you be talking to me? This guy is thirsty. Jesus is thirsty. He just wants water. And she starts putting all this prejudice in his face. First thing, I'm a Samaritan and I'm a woman. How can you ask from me? And she says, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And she was right. Have no dealings with Samaritans. But she was putting all these stumbling blocks on the way. She was causing Jesus to think about things that was not, were not in his mind. Because he was not ruled by nationality and tribalism and religion and all kinds of things. But now she comes with those things, puts them before him. You are this and I'm this and we are this and you are this. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who is talking to you, give me a drink. You will have asked him and he would have given you living waters. Now Jesus is trying to lift up the discussion to another level. 
Have you ever met somebody who's just petty on small things? And you're trying to redirect the, the, the conversation at a higher level. Because you realize, I don't, I'm not there. So Jesus changes gear and say, no, 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 you are on another dimension. You remember last Sunday's message? I'm on another dimension. I'm on a higher dimension. You're talking about this water that you see here. And I can give you living water. Amen. By asking you this water, this natural water, I'm actually giving you a favor. Because by serving me as a prophet of God that you don't see until now, you would, you, you would realize that there's much more I can give you in life. You need me more than I need you. It's a different perspective. People that have pe prejudice, they don't realize how much you have to offer them. People that are prejudiced by poverty, it's not always easy to help them. Some of you think it's easy. No. Because prejudice affects them as well. They start to make demands that were not part of what you thought to do. <laughs> and they start to come with politics that you never expected. But yet you were there simply just to help. Sometimes help comes at a price. Hello, somebody. Some of you who are, you know, doing business, you go into this village and there's a tender to do a certain development and it's good for the community and, and they saw it good and, and all kinds of that. But before you start, you are hitting many, many, many problems. How many of you know about this 30%? And there are people who have hijacked all of that and there are gangs who come to claim money and all kinds of things. You are only there to help. There are some places where development is, is not happening, not because nothing is being done, because people are still fighting. They are still fighting about who must get the tender. Which area must this complex or this mall be built? Instead of looking at a good thing coming, there's petty politics, people are suffering, everybody who should be benefiting is not benefiting. Hello? Say, let go. If you knew who is, who is asking for water, you would say, oh, Jesus asked me to just do a little thing that I can do. If she knew that today I will be preaching here and we will all be here and talking about that historic moment. If she knew that on a day like this, many churches will be quoting this scripture, this very story, she would have reacted in a different way. But her prejudice were letting her down. But Jesus was there to make sure that she lets go of a prejudice so that she can get hold of the promise. Amen. Now let's, let's jump to verse 16. Jesus said to her, go call your husband. Now this is another dimension. She did not expect to come up. Go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. And Jesus said, you have well said. You spoke very well. I have no husband. For you had five husbands. And the one whom you have is not your husband. In that you spoke truly. Hmm? Now she can't hide anymore. She can't hide behind her prejudice because her life is out in the open. And what does she say? Huh? I perceive you're a prophet. She's got a different perspective. Now all of her prejudice is falling away. 
But yet she does not stop there. Now she realizes he's a prophet. Now she brings the religious debate up. That's another prejudice. First it was about Jews and Samaritans. Now it's all about, but you guys worship in Jerusalem. Why is it you worship in Jerusalem? We worship here in, in, in our mountain, Mount Gerizim. And Jesus says, hey, please. You guys don't even know what you worship anymore because you're mixed up. We know whom we worship. You've got Baal, you've got this, you've got this, you've got God. You have mixed things. You don't know whom you worship. But we know whom we worship. But anyway, that debate is not important. A time is coming and now is. Hey, come on somebody. A time is coming and now the time is here. Because I am here. The true worshippers will not worry about whether they are in Jerusalem whether they are, they, are, they, are, they are in the mountain, that does not make a difference. Because now it's a different time. God is looking for those who would worship him in spirit and in truth. It doesn't matter whether you go to Jerusalem or in your house or anywhere, as long as you know the Father and you worship him in spirit and in truth. God is now looking for such to worship him. And that changes everything. God was preaching a life-changing message to her. God was bringing a perspective of revelation that this woman needed to get. First he realized he's a prophet. He knows everything about me. Now she hears another dimension. No, 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 no. That is old-fashioned. Now this is the will of God for us to worship him in spirit and in truth. Because God is spirit. Amen. Hallelujah. Say, I get the revelation. Because revelation will never leave you the same. And sometimes we're struggling because we lack revelation. Sometimes we're complaining because we lack revelation. Sometimes we are stuck in our habits and our lives are not changing one husband after the other because we lack revelation. And the day you get revelation, your actions will change. Your behavior will change because you now know that it's not about hiding away from people. It's not about trying to get a life. It's trying to get Jesus Christ who will change my life. Now think about this. All her life, she was earning a bad reputation. Okay, one husband. And then it fails another husband. It fails another husband. And now people start talking, huh? That one. Huh? Ah, we don't know what is happening with her. It can't be that all these men are wrong. There must be something with her. You know what I'm talking about must be something. This is the third one. And when they were still talking, another fourth one comes. Ha! Ah, have you heard? She's into the fourth one and she's even doing a wedding. Before you know it, number five. And now, when it comes to number six, he says, hi. I think I'll just get out of this marriage business. I'll just take from others. Now, she did not plan her life to turn out like that. You see, when you see people doing bad things, it does not make them bad. It, it makes you think that they are stuck into something that they need help out of. So that's why as a believer, you need to have that revelation. Don't condemn people because of their actions. It may look very bad. It may look the worst. But they are not the worst. And sometimes when God looks at their hearts, they are better than you. I'm telling you. It's very true. Because God does not look at the outside. 
God can see a good heart inside of them way better than you. You think you are better because you are not getting into things, but they are way better because they are crying to get out of things. Their heart is crying for help. They are tired of their life. And you see them and you condemn them for where they are, but you don't realize. Tomorrow God will use them way better than you ever thought. Amen. Because prejudice will always get you to think wrong about people. Now, Jesus is not saying, you stupid woman, you housebreaker, whatever word you can think about. He's not saying that he's getting through to her. He's patient with her. Come on, somebody. He's trying to get her into a place of revelation. Oh, thank you, Jesus. And look at what happens. Okay, let, let's read that, that scripture. Um, uh, John 4.20. I just want to be patient with this. Why is it that you Jews insist that Jerusalem is the only place of worship while we Samaritan claim it's here at Mount Gerizim where our ancestors worship? Now she's, she's bringing the debate now into another religious dimension, like I said. It's another prejudice. Jesus replied, believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. Um, you Samaritans know very little about the one you worship. While we Jews know all about him, for salvation comes through the Jews. But... The time is coming. Indeed, it is here now when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. Amen. For God is spirit, so those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. That is what is needed. The Father is looking for those who will worship him that way. Sorry. God is spirit and, and he wants those who worship him in spirit and in truth. Verse 25, the woman said, I know the Messiah is coming. The one who, will, who is the Christ, is called Christ. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. So this woman was trying to say, but you're trying to explain what is still coming. We are waiting for the Messiah to come and explain these things to us. Eh? You are going beyond your own knowledge. And how did Jesus reply? The one who is called the Christ, when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus told her, I am the Messiah. Hey, come on. You know, your prejudice will, will, will make you to miss the whole point. The whole point. I. I mean, this was a moment. I am the Messiah. When God wants to change a whole nation, a whole city, he does not need an army. He just needs one woman who would get a revelation. Amen. One woman, even one who is known for the wrong things. Because now, they will know her for the right things. Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. I am the Savior. The Messiah. Let's, let's jump to verse 28. The woman left the water, her water jar. She couldn't take it anymore. Now it's no longer time for debates and prejudices. She leaves the water jar beside the well and ran back to the village. 
telling everyone, come and see, come and see you. Talama, where is Talama? She must sing the song again. Come and see. A man who told me everything I ever did. Could he possibly be the Messiah? So the people came streaming from the village to see him. Verse 42. Then they said to the woman, Now we believe. Not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. Now we know that he is indeed the savior of the world. Oh, come on, somebody. All the rabbis, all the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the Jews had not received this revelation. They were still fighting him, contending with him, arguing with him. But these Samaritans, these poor Samaritans, this woman who was the worst of all, gets the revelation, brings the whole town to see Jesus, to listen to him. They get the revelation and they know the Savior is in town. It's no longer something we've been told about. It's no longer something we are waiting for. The man himself is here. The savior of the world has come. We have received the gospel. Now this woman who has nothing has become an evangelist. She has called the whole city, turned the whole city upside down. Now people are saying, it's no longer about you. It's about what we have heard ourselves. We know the Messiah has come. It's no longer about your reputation. It's no longer about your history. It's no longer about what you used to do. Now it's about the one who is the, the savior of the world. And everything changes. When he comes, we are all the same. When he comes, your reputation, your past falls away. Now you are a child of God. We do don't know you by your past we know you by your future come on somebody just let go of the prejudice it doesn't matter what people know about you all that matters is where Jesus wants to take you is what Jesus wants you to know is the revelation that you need to receive that will change your destiny When the Bible says all things have passed away, it's not just a statement. It's not just a statement of fact. It's a statement of truth. All things have passed away. When Jesus comes, everything changes. Come on, somebody. We look at a different dimension because God is leading us to an inheritance, to the promise that we must focus on. When Esther was still feeling like a queen, a beauty queen, and she thought maybe it's a beauty that made her a queen, and, and, and things changed immediately when she was start to, starting to get into a comfort space. And the word came, they want to kill all the Jews. What are you saying? She says, you know. Let, let me just, just give me a few minutes. Let me just read quickly. What what a response is. Let's start with Esther. I just went there. Then Esther told Hatak to go back and relay this message to Mordecai. All the king's official and even the people of the provinces know that anyone who appears before the king, everybody knows. Anyone who appears before the kings in this inner court without being invited is doomed to die unless the king holds out his gold scepter. And the king has not called me to come for 30 days. So Atak gave the Esther's message to Mordecai. Mordecai sent his reply to Esther. Don't think for a moment that because you are in the palace, you will escape when all the Jews are killed. Hmm? If you keep quiet at a time like this, deliverance and relief for the Jews will still arise from some other place but you and your relatives will die. Who knows? If perhaps you were made queen for such a time as this. Revelation. Revelation.
Revelation changes everything. Immediately she heard those words. Everything changed. You became queen. Not because of your beauty. No, not because of your strength and your might. Because you have a purpose in you. You became queen for such a time as this. There's a greater purpose. Stop, stop telling us about your prejudices. Forget about you not being a, a, a Jew. And your identity that is hidden from the king for the moment. Because it will all come out soon. And you will die. So stop thinking about your safety and, and your concerns about you being a foreigner and a queen at the same time and all of that and now you are appearing before the king and your death. Forget it. You will die anywhere. Don't allow your prejudices to stop you from moving. You know, you know, you know, you know what they say. You know what they say. You know what they say. Come on, stop all the reasons and focus on what is coming. What God wants you to do. Where God wants you to go. Focus on your calling. What is God asking you to do? I've had people say, Pastor, pray for me. I need a promotion. And all of a sudden, they get a triple promotion. And now they're coming back and saying, Pastor, it's good news. But also, there's bad news. What is the bad news? No, no, it's because, hey, I don't have confidence for this position. There's too much expectation. You know, people are looking at me. And some people were heard in the corridor saying, I'm too young for this. Hey, come on. Forget it. Who cares if you are still too young? Are you the first person? Amen. If God did it for you, walk like a boss. Amen. Walk tall and make sure that your high heels makes the loudest noise. So that they can say, oh, boss lady is coming. Amen. Why are you concerned about their concern? It's not yours. God lifted you up and God will prove you. Amen. So Esther changed immediately and she said, okay, all right. Everybody, we are fasting for three days and three nights. She walks boldly before the king. And the king holds up that golden scepter. And she said, Esther, my queen, what do you want from me? Ask me anything up to half of my kingdom. Where would she have had that moment if she did not forget her prejudices? Hallelujah. Everything changed from that moment. Haman fell fat on fell flat, flat on his face and everything changed. Mordecai is lifted up. A man had to parade Mordecai on the streets, celebrate him, a man he hated with all his heart. Salvation came for the Jews. You remember Gideon. He said this way, listen to this. Oh, poor Gideon. But Lord, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in all the whole tribe of Manasseh. And I am the least in my family. My entire family. That's a prejudice. I am the least. But the introduction was different. Some of you just need to know what God thinks of you. What was the introduction, the greeting? He said, and the angel appeared to him and said, okay, but now the Lord, up, uh, sorry, where is that? I just want to summarize because of time. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, in this, in the New Living Translation, it says the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, mighty hero, hmm? man of valor, mighty man, the Lord is with you, mighty hero, and you're saying I'm the least even in my own family. Perspective, prejudice. Say I'm above only and not beneath and the head only. 
and not the tail. Remember the story of Ruth. How she forgot about her prejudices. Forgot about everything. That she's a widow. And she says, no, no, no. I'm not going back home. I'm going with you. No people will be my people. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you die, I will die. She didn't allow herself to go back in shame. She said, I'm going forward. I don't care if I will be a foreigner where you are going. I'm going there anyway. And because she forgot about her prejudice, she became a great grandmother of Jesus Christ. You don't know what is standing before you, I'm telling you. You don't know what God has said before you. It will blow your socks off. It will blow your mind away. God has greater plans for you. Remember Job and his friends. You may stand up. Think about Job and his friends. Think about Job. He says in Job 12, 4 to 6, Yet my friends laugh at me, for I call on God and expect an answer. I'm, ju I'm a just and blameless man, yet they laugh at me. People who are at ease mock those in trouble. They give a push to the people who are stumbling. But robbers are left in peace. And those who provoke God live safely. Though God keeps them in power. I mean, this is, a, this is a, the words of a man who is broke. Broken. My friends are laughing at me. His friends were telling him, Baba, you need to, you need to confess your sins. <laughs> you need to... You, you just need to confess. I mean, this stuff that is happening with you is not normal. Just, just, just speak. And I always tell people that if you're feeling condemned and you're thinking you're in the problem that you have because God is punishing you, then God is unjust. I mean, if you still have criminals that we are feeding every single day in our prisons, Murderers, rapists, and God still gives them oxygen and is not killing them any days. And you feel that God must punish you for being his own child. What, why, why do you think about God in that way? That's condemnation. It does not come from God. You are not the worst of the worst. It is the devil that is doing this to you. Because he hates what God has made you to be. He hates what God has put in your life. He hates it with a passion. And he's trying to prove that it can destroy your life. Don't give in to that lie. Because God will also prove that he will raise you. Mm. God is faithful. God is faithful. So Job was struggling from prejudices of his friends who thought that you are in trouble because you have sinned. And yet, they themselves were not perfect. He says, I'm blameless. And they're criminals. And they have the guts to come and tell me, I need to repent. God is faithful. Amen. Don't allow anybody's prejudice to make you feel Anything that is not of God. Amen. Believe God only and his word. God will prove his word in your life. 
It does not matter your background, where you come from, where you grew up. God will prove that is God in your life. God has, God has done it before. That's why I'm giving you all these examples so that you remember this is what God does. This is what God specializes in. He picks up an Esther and who is an orphan, who is a foreigner. It can't be worse than that. No rights makes a queen go straight in the parliament, I mean palace of a foreign country and changes the destiny of a people. Think about what God can do with your life. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Just raise your hand. Say, Father, forgive me of all my prejudices. I let go of every prejudice that does not align with your word and the promises of your word. I believe with all my heart. I am above only. I am not beneath. I am the head only. I am not the tail. I believe only goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. I am blessed with abundance, with overflow. I may not have anything that I see now. But I know I have an inheritance that will be revealed soon in the land of the living. In Jesus' name, give him praise. Grace Mission International Church is on social media. Like us on Facebook, find us on YouTube, listen to the latest sermon on SoundCloud and follow us on Instagram. Grace, your connection to greatness.